sorry, I'm like distracted by Slack. I'm sure everyone is getting that Slack message. Um, so <laughs> Dr. Arson from Prehab is here to talk to us today about um, running basics and gait analysis, which is really exciting. So um, I've learned so much about um, my running technique. I've been, like I said, I've been running for like over 10 years and I had no idea that I run the way that I do. Um, I overstride a little bit. I, my knees go in just slightly, you know, there's just, all sorts of um, really cool things that I've continued to to learn every time I um, have a visit with um, Dr. Arson. So um, Arson, if you would like to take it away and introduce yourself. Sure, uh, yeah, thank you for the, the intro. Uh, I'm really excited to, to be working as, as part of this and uh, really excited to kind of give you guys the presentation today to give you a little bit of, uh, Iman and I, we decided to call it kind of like running one-on-one to uh, set you guys, no matter what your level of running is, to give you a good foundation uh, to kind of move forward with this, uh, with this challenge. And like Iman mentioned, it's really common for runners of all levels to, to benefit from learning new things regarding their running technique and kind of general injuries and, and things like that that can happen in order to help and try to prevent those injuries down the line. So kind of the, the more information you know, the less likely you are to, to develop an overuse injury with running. And then if you start to kind of feel like you might be getting an injury or, or something's getting irritated, you'll be able to identify it better and seek out help before it you know, becomes a bigger issue and then it becomes harder to treat. So all right, then Iman sent me over the uh, questions you guys submitted and I really just kind of worked to create the, uh, the presentation around those questions. Um, is this screen you guys see right now, the running 101 on here? Yes, you can see it. Okay, perfect. Cool. So we'll load that up. And just a little bit of a kind of intro about, there's Iman and I. So she does come to prehab, it's legit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my name is uh, Arsene Verobin. I'm a, a doctor of physical therapy. Um, I started working with Prehab in, in New York City, uh, became the clinical director there, the owner of Prehab. He's a, a long, kind of lifelong triathlete. And so we started to specialize in running. We created the running program there, uh, not just for runners, but for, you know, most athletics require uh, being able to run. So it, it, it's a really kind of a good specialty to, to have. And uh, the goal for us at Prehab is really to help work with runners to help prevent injuries and for them to have an understanding of what proper mechanics look like and give them the best tools that they can use to improve their running performance and hopefully not get injured. And if they do get injured, be able to, to get treated and, and know to seek out what, what type of treatment. And so some of the topics we're going to cover today, and again, this is based around the, the questions that you guys submitted, which is great. So hopefully um, I'll answer most of those with the presentation, and then I'll leave some time at the end to go over any questions you might have from the presentation. So jot, jot stuff down if, if something's not clear or if, if you want more information. So we'll cover uh, some common mistakes that uh, beginners might make with running, um, some common running form mistakes, early signs of an injury. Uh, benefits of getting a running analysis, some must-have tools if you're going to be running, uh, some important things about stretches and mobility drills, as well as strengthening exercises, and then at the end we'll, we'll go over a little bit of uh, resources. I sent over a couple of PDFs for Iman, one with uh, stretches and exercises that you guys will get access to, and it gives you a, a code where you can either have an app on your phone and use a web browser and actually view videos and descriptions of all the exercises. And then some links to kind of products that I like that I think are good for runners, but just to give you an idea of, of good things to have uh, for recovery and, and help to reduce the chance of injury. So um, some common beginner mistakes. Uh, a lot of you probably have heard kind of like this too much too soon, but what does that really mean? Uh, essentially, anything you do uh, that's going to put physical effort on the body, you want to make sure that it's gradual and you don't go 100% on your first day or maybe even like your first week because you want to be able to know how does your body respond tomorrow or the day after. And I, I think Iman really specifically tried to kind of strategize the, the challenges and everything where it's a buildup 
um, throughout. So hopefully that'll help lead you guys not to do too much too soon. Um, one big thing that that beginners will do, and actually you know experienced runners as well, is not do enough of a warm up with running. Oftentimes people might think that going on like a light jog for a little while is their warm up. At that point, you're already running. So we'll go over a little bit of some some principles for for a real good dynamic warm up. So you prepare your body. Uh, efficiently to be able to run and not only will it help reduce the chance of getting injured but it'll also improve your performance for the run and, and make your recovery much easier afterwards uh, not having a running shoe so the reason running shoes in, in quotations is because you should have shoes that are specifically for running in other words you don't walk in those shoes and for some people this is like a huge like light bulb when you when we walk and when we run we have very different movement patterns and those movement patterns will present with different wear patterns on the shoes. And so if you're walking in a shoe, it's going to start to wear the shoe off in a certain way. Then when you go to run, you're basically going to have a, a surface that you've been walking on, changing your mechanics for running. So you should have a, a shoe or, or a couple of shoes even that are specific for running and you only use them for running. You don't exercise in them uh, and you, do, you don't do any walking in them either. Um, not having a, a prehab routine is a common mistake. And what a prehab routine refers to is a set of exercises and stretches, ideally that are specific to you, but there's some general ones that I'll give to you guys as well that really help prevent um, any kind of lingering issues from developing or, or formation of injury. So something where you can help recover the body and make sure you have like your body has the strength and capacity to be able to run and, and do the, the things that you want to do without it getting overloaded and getting injured and then running through pain. So, you know, the, like if you're in a race, like, you know, and, and you're going for it, most people will, will run through pain. But if you're in a challenge like this one, or if you're training, it's really important to be able to identify what is an injury type pain versus like, oh, like my muscles are fatiguing and I'm starting to get tired. So I'll give you some, um, some things to think about that can start to identify maybe an early injury happening where you can identify it and not have to push through it as you run. So um, some common running form mistakes, and we're, I'm gonna go into these a little bit more specifically, uh, but big ones that I see are overstriding. Uh, collapsing refers to collapsing like the hips, knees, or, or ankles, and that's usually a, a strength issue. Uh, crossing over too much, so when somebody's running, they're basically like weaving with their legs or running even too wide. So some of these things have kind of like a Goldilocks zone where if you're crossing over too much, it can cause an issue, but also if you're like running super wide and you're um, kind of bobbing side to side, that can cause a, a set of its issues as well. Uh, having too much bounce or not enough bounce. And that can depend on the distance and the speed that you're running. But for the most part, there is a range of how much bounce you should have when you're running. Too much of an excessive bounce will basically be like jumping off of a, a high height and causing your, your muscles to get overloaded and your joints to get overloaded. While not enough bounce will cause you to stay on the ground for a long time and uh, not give you enough of a spring. So there's a little bit of a sweet spot with that as well. And then a really other type of common uh, running mistake is running too tall and too upright and that can jeopardize how well your muscles can function. So we're gonna go into each one a little bit more specifically. So this is an example of overstriding and the, uh, the black outline or the black background picture images here, that's from the 3D running analysis that we do. So you guys also get a little bit of a feel uh, what type of assessment we do and what type of information it gives you. So for, for this athlete, uh, you can see his foot contact is way in front of his center of mass. So he, this is where he's making his first initial contact on the ground as he's running. While if we kind of sum up his, his mass, it'll land somewhere around here. So there's a really big differential here. So overstriding is characterized by basically landing too far in front of your center of mass. 
And the example I always give to people is if you imagine holding a dumbbell close to your chest versus holding that dumbbell further out, it's going to be much more difficult to hold it further away from you. It's going to be more straining on your muscles. So it's the same thing when you overstride. If you land too far in front of you, aside from increasing your ground contact time, it increases your braking forces. You basically have to catch yourself, but it also increases the forces because of how far you are from your center of mass. So your muscles have to work harder as well. Uh, overstriding can lead to shin splints, hamstring strains, uh, knee pain. Those are kind of common things that can be seen with, with overstriding. And the, the black background image here, this actually, our running analysis gives us an actual number of how far you're overstriding. And this green area here is an ideal range for the, the pace that you're keeping. And this is based on a thousand lead athletes. And we use that as our reference point for different parameters to figure out quickly which things you need to work on and which things you, you do really well. Moving on to the next one. So collapsing is, is the other one that we talked about. Uh, this is very typical uh, as a result of weakness around the hip muscles, specifically the gluteus maximus um, and or medius muscle. It can lead to collapsing at the hip, knee, and or ankle. Sometimes you could see it at one joint, two joints, or at all three of them. And this can often lead to either outer or inner knee pain because of the forces and stress that's put onto it, but it can also lead to foot and ankle pain. So with this runner, um, the reason this, this green uh, circle is here is what when we do a running analysis, we wanna make sure we see something called the knee window. And basically, I always want to be able to see some space between the knees throughout the entire run. And when we get a closing of that knee window, it's an indication that some collapsing is happening. So for her, the ankle positioning is pretty good, but there's that collapsing at the knee. And in this other image, you can see there's some collapsing at the hip as well. So it's bringing the knees in together. For the, the gait analysis that we do, this will track the actual degree position of the knee. So it'll, when you see like the, the reason there's a light blue circle and a dark blue circle, the light blue circle is a recent run and the dark blue circle is a previous run. So it's a comparison of the two, but it'll give us the degrees uh, and the amount of valguses when the knees are collapsing or like a knock knee type of position. So then we know exactly what we need to address. The other one that we talked about was the, either the crossing over or the two wide separation. So two wide is, is not pictured, but here you can see for this athlete, her left leg really tends to cross over where her body's midline is. So we call it kind of like a weaving pattern while her right leg actually lands right underneath her hip. And so that's ideal positioning there. A really good way to assess whether or not you present with this, and this is pretty common uh, running impairment. One thing we'll often see is too much movement through the arms and too much rotation through the upper body. That's because your, your, your body's trying to get you back in the center line with your legs rotating too far one way. So you try to compensate for that with your upper body. That's a really quick sign. And the other really common thing is you'll see your shoe marks on your calf. And that's because the, the legs are weaving across. And as you start to bring the leg over uh, forward, it, it, it catches the, the calf that's in front of it. Uh, so that's a really common thing. And the system that, that we use will let us know how wide of a foot separation you have so we can track the actual objective values for that. Uh, having too wide of a, a step separation can lead to too much lateral forces. So it basically causes you to shift too much side to side. And if your goal is to be running forward, any excessive side to side motion is inefficient. It's a lost energy that your body's gonna have to pick up and deal with. This can lead to excessive torque and rotational forces on the hip and knee joints. Uh, and this one is one of the easier ones to correct, especially if it's the weaving, because you can uh, literally run down a line and make sure you, your feet don't cross over that line as you're running. If the step separation, like if you're running and you really feel that kind of like side to side bobbing, then you may wanna try and imagine like you're running on a tightrope and try to bring your legs in together to see if that helps you level out a little bit better. having too much or not enough bounce. So the, the athlete pictured here, um, I don't know where she's jumping to, but it's gonna be a lot of, uh, a lot of stress on her uh, muscles and joints on, on the landing. Uh, so being too bouncy is gonna decrease your running economy. 
when we're running, we ideally want to have uh, an equal force vertical and going straight. So it gives us some forward propulsion to go forward. So, but if we don't launch too far excessively uh, upwards, because that's also going to be lost effort and it's going to be too stressful in the muscles and joints. Uh, kind of a, a common way to quickly diagnose this is if you see runners, especially like a, a female runner with maybe like the hair and a ponytail, and you see that ponytail just like bouncing all over the place, that's a, usually a quick indication that, that somebody is too bouncy. Uh, having not enough bounce. So, and again, I mentioned this could be a little bit more speed dependent as well. So this athlete, for example, is an ultra marathoner. So for him to have uh, kind of too much of a bounce is going to be really taxing over like 50 miles. But for most people, somewhere a range and, and watches and, and different types of devices can help keep this metric now. Somewhere between like six centimeters and 10 centimeters of a, of a, a vertical displacement, which is how much your body's gonna move up and down, is a good range for, for most people. Obviously, if you don't have a way to, to check for that, it's a little bit hard. But if you feel like you're you're very bouncy, you may want to maybe imagine like you're running underneath like a bridge, like a really low bridge where you, where you don't want to hit your head into it. And if you feel like you're running and you're spending a time, a ton of time on the ground, there in that point, just think about being a little bit more springy. Try to imagine like your foot and ankle are like springs, and they're trying to set you up into the air a little bit more. Running too upright. So this athlete, you can see her, her torso is almost vertical or even slightly leaning backwards. And what this will do is it'll make it really hard for the muscles around the hip to work to, to get you to propel forward. So by being so far back, it shortens the glutes and it makes it harder for them to contract because they're already shortened. And this type of um, running impairment will often lead to hamstring strains or quad strains because those muscles will now start to work excessively for what the glutes are supposed to be doing. And it'll put a, um, too much strain on them and, and kind of bring them over into, uh, into an area of injury. Uh, ideally, so, and again, this is almost impossible to be able to measure without some kind of technology that, that's monitoring you. But uh, a range of motion, or I'm sorry, uh, a degree of a forward lean of about like two and a half to three and a half degrees um, is ideal. With this one, a, a quick way to just diagnose it by looking at it is when somebody's running with like a really proud chest, like their rib cage is, is super flared up and you see maybe even like a lot of tightness in their lower and their upper back and they're, they're kind of like in this upward straining position. And an easy way to correct for this is either to imagine like you're running into a strong wind, so you, you're forced to lean forward a little bit, or maybe even think about if you're not running up a, a, an incline, but imagine like you are, you would have to lean forward a little bit. And some people really find it helpful if you have like a some kind of a logo or something on your shirt. If you just imagine about pushing that logo forward, it'll typically position your body in a, in a good position where your glutes can work well to run and you don't end up over stressing a lot of the other muscles. This type of running style is often coupled with the overstriding because by being so upright, you end up shifting your center of mass backwards. And then when you, your foot lands out in front of you, it's too far away from your center of mass. So bringing your, your body forward more. And again, this, this is not bringing your body forward like from your lower back. The lean forward comes more from the ankles. Uh, I, don't want, yeah, I don't want you guys like humped over like <laughs> running across. Uh, it, it's, you want to think of it as kind of leaning forward from the ankles more than anything. But being too upright can lead to like upper back or lower back pain. Like we mentioned, hamstrings and, and quadriceps as well. So those are kind of the, the common uh, running impairments I'll often see. Some early signs of an injury, I, I love this meme um, because, <laughs> because people really some runners or they'll, they'll just do anything to, to keep running, but really kind of specific things that, that you might notice that might be indications of a, uh, an injury starting to form is localized pain with running, especially if it's on one side. So, you know, running is a bilateral activity, obviously. And so if you start getting like a local pain at your knee or your hip or down by your ankle, uh, that doesn't feel like it's a muscle type of work. Um, it, it's a sign that something might be getting overloaded there. Numbness and tingling is never okay. 
if you feel any numbness or tingling, it the only things that will do that are right, a little bit of a nuance. There, there's some electrolyte imbalances that can cause some numbness and tingling, but for the most part, it, it indicates a, an injury to a nerve or maybe like decreased blood flow or overstretch to a nerve. So if you're feeling like numbness or tingling, that's definitely not a thing to push through and you want to make sure to, to get that checked out. It, it typically indicates some kind of nerve injury. Um, another, some other kind of signs of an early injury can indicate uh, or pain that lasts more than, than 24 hours after running may indicate early signs of an injury because uh, typically if it's like muscle strain and muscle work within 24 hours or so, it'll usually uh, resolve itself. But if it continues to linger and it, it goes into like other activities that, that aren't including running, then it may be some signs that you might be developing an injury. Um, a common one is, is pain that consistently starts at a certain mileage or duration of the run. So sometimes it has to do with distance. Sometimes it has to do with how long you've been running for. And the pain starts to kick in and it's in the same spot and it feels the same all the time. This is usually an indication that you're working beyond your capacity. And the example I always give to people is if you think about your body kind of like a bucket um, and your, your strength, your range of motion, your endurance, all of that is the size of the bucket. And then any physical activity that you do, whether it's exercise, running, whatever, whatever you're doing, is water that you're putting into the bucket. So once you, your activity starts to exceed your capacity and the water starts to overflow out of the bucket, that's when an injury can happen. So if you're running at a certain to a certain mileage and you're starting to feel some discomfort, that water is overflowing the bucket and you've exceeded your, your tissue's ability to be able to handle the stress that you're putting on it. So definitely don't push through that. And it's a really good idea to, to speak somebody and, and to get that checked out. Um, as far as like the capacity analogy, two things you can do. One, you can decrease the amount of water you're putting into the bucket so you don't exceed where your, where your body's capable of. And you could also make the bucket bigger by improving your mobility, improving your strength, and increasing your stability, increasing your endurance. That's going to make your bucket bigger so you can handle uh, more activities. Hope that analogy makes sense to people. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I've been kind of referencing it, but don't confuse like muscle soreness with an injury pain. Muscle soreness, especially it's called DOMS, it's a delayed onset of muscle soreness. This people will typically feel when they've exercised a, a muscle they haven't exercised in a while, they did a new activity where that muscle starts to ache and, and feel uncomfortable. Sometimes they, that'll kick in like as late as 48 hours after an activity. So you might've worked out, next day been fine. And then the day after that, all of a sudden like, whoa, like my, my hamstrings are, are feeling it. So muscle soreness were, especially from running will typically be bilateral, meaning you'll feel it in both legs or, or both hips or something like that. It'll feel, you'll feel it mostly when that muscle is being used. It'll feel like maybe a little bit uncomfortable if you go to stretch it, or if it's like your quads and you're going up the stairs, you're going to feel it all of a sudden. And most likely the next time you do that activity, you won't have that muscle soreness again. It's, it's usually that, that first time of, of trying something new or, or maybe like loading it higher than you usually did uh, versus like a, uh, an injury pain is a little bit more what we described about things that are like a little bit more local or start to present themselves at certain times or certain activities. That'll typically indicate more of an injury starting to happen. Uh, so we'll go over some um, some benefits of a, uh, a running analysis uh, quickly. So the running analysis that we do at, at Prehab, uh, we use a, a couple of different systems, but the one that we get the most data from is the 3D running analysis on the treadmill. And this is really beneficial because it gives you objective evaluation of your running mechanics. Um, our system creates like a skeletal representation. It gives you all those dynamics that we saw earlier when we we're looking at the uh, running uh, mechanics and it helps us to quickly identify different running form strengths so things that you're like really good at and we know we don't really need to tweak anything there and then figure out your weaknesses as well so we can find the, the low-hanging fruit and be able to focus on those things to make sure it, it benefits your performance and, and decreases the chance for injury in addition to that uh, we also do a full orthopedic assessment for strength mobility and stability everything relevant to running because we can see a lot of things in the running analysis on the treadmill 
but that's a little bit more of almost like an MRI. It's gonna show me what's happening. It's not gonna tell me why it's happening. So it's really important to then do an assessment and see, you know, is it the strength in the hip that's causing an issue? Is it tight ankles that's causing you to run this way? So we, we have to put those things together to create like a customized exercise program specific to the impairments that you have and also couple it with running drills and things you can think about while you're running to help to correct the mechanics as well because those two things have to go together you have weakness at the hip and it presents itself in like a collapsing type of running style when you're running and all of a sudden you know you're like oh i gotta get my hip stronger you start doing like a bunch of clamshell exercises which is laying on your side with maybe like a resistance band and, and lifting your knee and while it's a good foundational exercise it has nothing to do with running. You're on your side, your knees are bent, you're lifting one leg. You might strengthen the muscle, but your brain will never connect, connect that exercise to a running activity. So even though your muscle might be stronger, when you go to run, you're gonna to continue to run the same way because the actual running form hasn't been retrained. So it's really important to put those things together. to the next one so this is just a uh, this is actually iman's uh, running analysis and a, a comparison of where she kind of came in and she was like a little bit chill and she hasn't been like running or training too too aggressively and so we we did a we did a, a quick analysis and it was like way worse than what we did before uh, where she was like really in, in the heap of things and and um actually kind of uh, training while she was running so we just with a few simple cues um kind of basically helped to, to improve her mechanics so it, i know it's probably a little bit hard to see but like the lighter blue was the run after um, we did some cueing while the darker blue were like not as good of values when we first did the analysis so her running stride rating um, jumped up as well but basically the system that we use it'll classify somebody into a specific type of running style the eco sprinter is those a thousand elite athletes that we use as a reference point at specific paces and uh, there's different styles that have different pros and cons so a power racer is the fastest type of running profile but it's also the most injured versus a quick stepper is least injured but they also have some difficulty producing speed so there's some some pros and cons there and the results also give us information about the displacement of center of mass so like how much vertical bounce there is how much excessive side to side motion there might be uh what the hip ranges of motion look like what the knees range ranges of motion look like and what the symmetry between the two sides is it'll let us know if you're running too wide or, or crossing over too much whether or not the knees are collapsing or maybe even like running a little bit more bow-legged and we also get uh, information about torque and linear forces on the hip and knee joints both for the right and left sides so we can compare um, whether or not one side is getting long uh, loaded higher than the other and if there's a, a particular knee or hip that that might be at a chance for injury for, for getting uh, overloaded into high joint fo forces so some must-have tools for uh for running a good pair or a decent pair of running shoes i know you guys are going to get a little bit more information from that from a milestone as well but somewhere like in a ballpark probably like 80 to 200 bucks you can get yourself a pretty good running shoe uh foam roller i think is essential if i only had to have two pieces of equipment one of them would be a foam roller the other one would be a, a, a trx trainer but not as relevant for running uh, i think it's really important to have resistance loop bands and to have a stretch strap that'll really cover you with most kind of prehab types of things that would be good for you to do for running and might be a little bit of an outdated references from what I think a discover credit card commercial but uh, run, running injury free that's priceless so and not only is it priceless it'll actually save you money because you get injured then you have to seek medical help and, and it actually becomes really costly so um, th those are the the good things to get and I put those on there on the resources uh, sheet some links to those they are not mandated you don't have to get the ones that i, rec I recommended but those are the ones that i like so I, I, I just put them on there for you uh so some stretches and mobility to prevent injury so I, I created an exercise program for you guys that has some stretches that are really essential to do as well as some strengthening exercises uh, but a really important thing is to have a dynamic warm-up prior to running so this is not jogging this is an actual warm-up that can include things like lunges and squats 
And uh, on the resources, you'll also have a link to a prehab warm up, which is about five minutes to get through. But like the goal of those warm ups is to one, these are like essential things to have in your warm up. You want to make sure you increase your respiratory rate so your um, your breathing rate increases so you can get more oxygen into your blood. You want to make sure your heart rate increases so then that ox the oxygen can get into the blood and get to working muscles. And you want to increase your range of motion. And this is not in the sense of like doing like static stretches where you're holding them for a long time, but you want to do some dynamic stretches and movement to get your, your joints and um, muscles to increase a little bit in, in active flexibility to be ready for the run. You, you don't want your run to be what's increasing your flexibility. Uh, static stretching and foam rolling. So that's good either after your run or on your off days. You don't want to do static stretching prior to going on the run. When you're doing a static stretch, the goal is to improve the length of a muscle. And so while you're doing that, you're, you're pulling the muscle fibers apart. And for uh, a short window of time, that decreases the amount of force that a muscle can produce. So you kind of like stretch a muscle apart and it makes it harder to contract to really produce a lot of force. So you don't want to do static stretching and then go on, on a run where you're required to really use much more muscle effort. So it's good to, foam rolling is, is totally fine to do before running, but I think it's really beneficial to do after running so you can help decrease some of the tension in, in the muscles and in the fascia. And um, definitely, you know, try to stretch on your off days as well to maintain flexibility and improve your flexibility for running. A really important thing when you do static stretches, you have to hold them for at least 30 seconds. So we, we usually recommend uh, three times 30 seconds to ensure that you're actually uh, lengthening the muscle. If you just do a stretch and you feel a little bit of the stretching sensation for a few seconds and then you let it go, that, that's all that's going to happen is you're going to have the stretching sensation, but the muscle is not actually going to improve. So it, when you do a static stretch, the intensity of the stretch is less important than how long you hold the stretch. I always recommend for people, make sure you're able to breathe comfortably while you're stretching. If you're like stretching and your, your veins are popping out and your face is turning red, that's not gonna help improve the flexibility of your muscle. It's actually gonna tense everything up and, and not let you stretch as well. So don't kill yourself with intensity, just try to be able to breathe and, and be able to hold the stretch instead, kind of put, put the time into it. Uh, some critical strengthening exercises. So everybody on this chat, that's what I want you all to look like by the end of this month. Uh, just kidding. The, don't look like that for if you want to be a, a you know a successful runner uh, necessarily. But um, really, really critical things to to focus on for uh, for strengthening exercises for running. You have to do single leg exercises. There's so many clients that I get that come in. They're like, oh yeah, strengthening program. I do like lunges, which are semi-single leg squats and this and that. Running is a single leg activity. It's one of the biggest distinguishing factors between walking and, and running is running. You're always on one leg. So if you're not training exercises in a single leg fashion, then you're, they're not going to relate to, to running. Your, your brain is not going to connect those things. They have to be weight bearing exercises as well. Running is a weight bearing sport. So like the clamshell that I was talking about earlier, it's a good exercise. And I, I, give it to people if they need to build up some foundational strength, but it's a non weight bearing exercise. Um, so are like laying on your side and, and doing leg raises and stuff like that. Those exercises are not gonna give you the biggest bang for your buck for running. So you wanna make sure you include weight bearing exercises. For most people that I see, uh, we always have to address gluteus maximus and gluteus medius strengthening. So those are muscles at your hips. The, the gluteus maximus is like the, the bigger buttocks muscle. And then the gluteus medius is on the side of your hip. It kind of looks like a fan shaped muscle and that really helps maintain the position of the pelvis. And they both really help to decrease any of that collapsing that I was talking about earlier. So those exercises are really important to include in the program. Core strengthening, um, even a couple of exercises will make a big difference. Oftentimes, once you start to, to fatigue, uh, especially if you don't have that stability in your core, the muscles in your legs will, will start to have to overwork and, and can start to become strained. So you have to have a really stable base. Um, I tell people, you know, you can't fire a cannon out of a canoe. So you, your core can't be a canoe. It has to be solid ground. So your cannons, which are your arms and your legs, they can work well. Uh, so that's really important. 
Uh, calf and Achilles tendon strengthening uh, are really important to include. So I, I put that on the exercise program for you. And plyometric exercises. So uh, what plyometrics refers to is a muscle going on stretch and then quickly being able to shorten and produce power. Running is a plyometric activity. Every time you you take a stride, your muscles stretch, and then they have to be able to shorten and propel you forward. So it's important to include that as well. I, I include, a, um, it's a plyometric exercise, but it's a, it's a wall drill where your hands are on the wall and you're exchanging your legs. So it's nothing like you're, you're not like jumping off of boxes or, or nothing crazy like that, but it'll, it'll give your body some of that um, plyometric activity. The resources uh, that I talked about, so, there will be uh, a link to a video for a warm up. I highly recommend you, you guys give this a try. Um, heads up, it, you know, the burpees are included in that warm up, but the, it'll really make your run a lot more pleasurable once you can kind of wor warm your whole body up for it. Uh, you'll have the stretching and strengthening program that you can see videos of. Uh, additionally, for everybody that's part of this program, I'm a prehab I'm offering complimentary 20 minute, whether in person at the facility here or a virtual consult. So if anything pops up or if you guys are just interested in, in learning a little bit more and want to have a conversation, uh, you'll have my email or the phone number here to reach out to. We can schedule a session um, to just talk and see if you have any additional questions or something specific to get into. And then I also included those those links to the specific um, exercise tools like the foam roller and, and the resistance bands. Thank you all so much. It's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Dr. Arson. That was awesome. And that is so generous of you. I was that surprised me. Um, we did get a couple questions on the chat and um, a lot of it. Um, let me just pull up. Um, maybe we can have yeah, you for answer. Um, so somebody asked like how often they should replace their running shoes. Uh, so, I mean, there's like some mileages that, that you can think about I, for me and Iman can kind of um, give her opinion on this as well. One of the easiest way for me to know when somebody needs to replace their shoes, if the outsole, like the, the bottom of the shoe, if you stop seeing the tread, in certain parts of it. Mm -hmm. So if that area has worn away already, it typically means that the rest of the shoe is also impaired. Like it could look really nice and clean, but if the tread has started to, to wear away, it typically won't give you enough support as well. Good what do you think? Know. Yeah, that I would also, if you're logging your miles, I would probably suggest um, maybe 500 miles probably works. If it's a lighter weight shoe, then um, probably like 300 miles. Um, if you don't, if you're not training for anything and if you're not reaching 500 miles quickly, then uh, we probably would recommend rotating them out like maybe every six to eight months. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so we got another question about um, from Hannah who said that she, her knees feel a little sore and it's because of, she thinks it's because of her shoes. What type of shoes should she get if her knees are sore or getting sore while she's running? So very hard question because every person is, is pretty individual and you can have even somebody who physically is exactly the same as you are and you give them the same shoe and they'll perform completely different in it. it I describe a, a shoe as like a, a filter between your foot and the ground and different bodies will interpret different filters differently. Um, and I, again, I think Iman could probably give you some, some recommendations as far as, you know, maybe getting an assessment at a, at a running shoe store um, or coming in for like a, a, a running assessment to get a little bit more specific of what type of a shoe would be good for you. One thing oftentimes, not oftentimes, but, um, Frequently, I get clients that come in that maybe have been prescribed too much of like a restrictive shoe. So if it's like a, a really strong motion control or like a stability shoe, because maybe they pronate and whoever recommended the shoe for them feels like they shouldn't pronate so much. And pronation is just the, the arch is dropping down. Sometimes it, it could be excessive. Sometimes it you can pronate, but you can control it and it's not an issue. So getting a shoe that's very restrictive once you block that motion of the shoe, your body's still going to have to deal with the forces coming in. And oftentimes it'll start to increase like the rotation and the forces at the knee. So if the shoe is like very rigid and you're experiencing knee pain, 
potentially try to get into a little bit more of like a, a flexible shoe, but what do, you, what do you think, Iman? Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. I mean, it, it could come down to the type of shoe that you're wearing. It could come come down to, like, it's really important to understand your gait um, to get a gait analysis so that you know what type of shoe to be fitted for. Um, and then we'll discuss that a little bit more in depth next week with Greg from Milestone, um, who owns a, uh, the owner of um, a running shoe store. Um, but I, I agree with everything that Arson said. Awesome. Okay, I got another question from Josh. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name, but Joshua. Um, what, what's a good way to balance strength exercises and running workouts per week for a beginner? So usually I'll recommend the strengthening exercises somewhere around like three times a week. Um, and it, it's also good because you don't want to continue to exercise the same muscle day after day. That can also lead to overuse. Like it's very easy to develop tendonitis by continuing to do the same exercise every day. Uh, so it's a good way to be able to space out the workouts. Um, I, I think a, a good compromise could often be to maybe make the running days a little bit more heavy on like the stretching and foam rolling in the days that you're not running or not maybe doing as of intense of a run or not as much mileage to then include the strengthening exercises in there. But usually I recommend five days a week of like some stretching and mobility and about three days a week of strengthening. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I have another question that says, um, so if you're a beginner and you're trying to do more challenging runs like the pyramid work track workouts, um, how should they split up the run into larger intervals? Or should they split up their runs into larger intervals so they're not straining them, themselves? I'm not really quite sure what that means. So Hannah, if you want to explain. Yeah, I mean, definitely for, for a beginner, um, it, it makes sense to try not to overload it. And you could always kind of increase the intensity with the following workout. Um, I hope that kind of. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. Um, and I honestly, like for, for me, and I tell this to all like new runners is really like be mindful of your body. Like, even if you think you're going to do a mile or two miles or you know 5k today, like if you feel your body out and if it's like something that you can push through in terms of like, it's just a, okay, my body's just warming up. That's one thing, but if you know you're fatigued, I always feel like I get injured when I, my body's actually fatigued and I'm pushing through the miles. Um, so just be mindful of how you're feeling, um, especially women. Um, I, I and I say this for, for women in particular when in our cycles, like sometimes our bodies are more fatigued closer to our cycles, and like that's just something to be mindful of as well. Um, so I have another question that says, how often? How often do you recommend having off days? Like, for example, if she goes run, should they run every day to start off or should they have off days? Uh, definitely for, yeah, for like a beginner, um, I think off days are really good to be able to kind of feel out where, where you're at because if you go on a run and then, like you said, like you, you need to like maybe recover a little bit or something's feeling sore, you feel tired and you start pushing into it. Um, Hi. Oh, no, 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 not today. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm here late. Um, <laughs> they came to clean the place. Uh, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, to, to the, the, uh, the off days. So uh, yeah, it's definitely a good idea because it can help you gauge like how well your body's respond, responding to the runs. And then you, if you did a run or like a harder run and you took an off day and you, you felt okay, maybe next time you could do a stronger run and then maybe do like a little bit of a lighter day the next day and see how that, that feels out. But definitely for a beginner, I think it's a good idea to um, maybe like, especially after a strenuous run to, to take an off day. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Iman, do you want to, do you have any other things to add? I know we're over time, but I wanted to take a moment to just thank all of you for joining. I know it's been a crazy day for a lot of us and, um, you know, but I, you know, you, you are truly making a really great step towards just 
your own physical wellness. And we hope that, you know, you're, we see more of your connections on Slack. I know it's hard to not be on campus or see each other in person, but it's been really cool to see all the engagement there. Um, Dr. Arson, thank you, thank you. If we can all just give Dr. Arson a round of applause for being with us today. We appreciate you so much. And, um, you know, if you will have all of this contact information, Iman's gonna provide uh, the slides and we, we also recorded this presentation. So um, once we get it all uploaded, we'll send it over through Slack. All righty, thank you. Awesome, cool. Yeah, and everybody, please feel free. Don't feel like intimidated to, to reach out to me. Um, if you email me and it takes me a couple of days, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll try to get back to you guys as soon as possible and also um, be able to, to schedule out those um, kind of complimentary consults if you guys want to um, talk about anything a little bit more. And I saw somebody was asking a question about the, the pricing of the, the gate analysis. Yes. Um, we'll offer a 10% discount if anybody's interested in, in, in doing it as far as the, the students. Uh, but we also have like a lot of options for payment plans and um, a bunch of different things. So if you get in touch with me, we, we can have uh, more conversation about it. Great. Thank cool. you, Dr. Arson. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will provide uh, all the information on Slack. All right. Cool. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.